Hello, thank you to those who were able to join yesterday in our, our video meeting. Um, what I want to do real quick today is um, review what you read yesterday about oral history. It was the first page you read yesterday. And oral history or oral tradition is something that we're going to spend this chapter and the next chapter on the uh, Dakota and the chapter that on the Ojibwe we're going to talk about. Because um, it's very important. Basically, you can see that the, the meaning of our vocab words are over here in the columns. Oral history is basically teaching a, a lesson or teaching about your culture through stories, so telling stories out loud. And that's one thing that happened with the petroglyphs, those rock carvings, is those stories were passed down from generation to generation. And it's a job of the archaeologist to figure out what those carvings mean, what, what's going on in the petroglyphs. And yesterday you read and you answered some questions about what some of the possible meanings could be for the hand carvings at Jeffers. And then you stop at this orange box that says the government protects burial mounds. Today um, in class, I'm hoping that we'll get to these orange bo this orange box. So again, you see we're down here where it says scroll text. You should be able to scroll and continue reading more like that. And then there's uh, question number nine in your packet that goes with that. So I know yesterday we only answered through question five. Six and seven and eight, we will get back to, just not right now. So don't cross those out. You'll be doing them. But question number nine, you'll be answering after you read the orange box today. And the other thing I'm going to be going over today is the notes. Well, before I go to the nat, the notes, your uh, vocab, or excuse me, vocab, daily geos, you can see just you found yesterday, I posted it here. You can find the, the questions, and there we go. Um, yesterday, you did these first two questions. Today, you're answering the second box. And all of the information you need to answer those questions, I also included here. Now, sometimes you might get into a problem where it, it encountered where it can't open or preview this. So what you need to do is you click on these three dots up here, and it says open a new window. Well, then it might open. You might get a chance to see them all. Just need to give the internet time to work. And here, it doesn't work again. So the best thing to do is where this arrow is, click download. And you can see it'll download, and then you can just click on that, and it should. You just have to find the file under your, under your downloads, and you should be able to find it, and then it'll open up. If you have any questions about that, let me know. Once you download it, all of them should work so much easier. So and these are all the maps that you'll need for this entire Daily Geo. You just need to figure out which one is the one that'll work and then go from there. And then it's the same thing. Let me close this out. Maybe I'll close this out. Oh, it doesn't want to. There we go. So then that's how you find the information for these Daily Geos. Thursday, please turn those in. So we're doing a box a day. The other thing I'm going to go over today is your notes. Um, in Minnesota and around the world, there are two types of boundaries or borders between whether it's states, whether it's between countries. One of them, it says natural terrain. I refer to that as physical borders, physical things that you can see, like lakes, rivers, and oceans. And we talked about that earlier. Last week we went over the notes, like Minnesota has a, shares a border with Wisconsin. Part of that border is rivers. So the, the St. Croix River and also the Mississippi River. If you're on one side of the river, you're in Minnesota. The other side of the river, you're in Saint, uh, you're in Wisconsin. So physical features like that. So it's like this says natural terrain, but I call them physical borders. And the other one, this says artificial. I say political. So we have physical boundaries, political boundaries. Physical, these natural terrains are things that you can see, like rivers and such. Political, you can't. Like the border between Minnesota and Iowa, there's nothing you can uh, you can see there. You just kind of know where it is. Sometimes it can be based on lines of latitude, longitude. Those are just areas that people have agreed to. Minnesota comes from a Lakota word. Lakota are a family of the Dakota. Some of the first to settle this area in what we call Minnesota. And Minnesota roughly translates to two kind of different meanings, cloudy water or sky-tinted water, referring to all of the water we have in Minnesota. Up here, we did have some... <laughs> Nicknames, we talked about Minnesota. Another one, we're known as the Theater of Seasons because we are very fortunate in Minnesota. We do get to 
witness all four of the seasons usually, you know, the summer, fall, winter, and spring. Early transportation before planes, trains, and automobiles and all that stuff, most of the transportation was done by people walking or on water. Eventually, horses became a part of it. Um, one of the important rivers in Minnesota is the Mississippi River. Back when ships and boats, especially steamships, were the first ones to come on the Mississippi River, they wanted water so it was deep enough. So here it says you can see deep enough, a nine-foot channel. So they wanted it wide enough for barge traffic. Barges are these big, like, rectangular-shaped boats. You can put a lot of stuff on them. They flow up and down. But they wanted to make sure the water was wide enough and deep enough. So they would use dams, so, you know, structures you make, control how much water flows. They also used wing dams. So when they were first building wing dams, you can see on this page here, they were built, uh, they would come from the shore of the river. So here you can see they are in the process of building them. It says wing dams were constructed with alternating layers of willow brush covered by rocks quarried, which means dug out, from nearby bluffs. The method worked because a majority of the more than 1,000 wing dams built are still in place a century later. So they're building these wing dams like this, and they end up looking like this. So you can see them coming out of parts of the Mississippi River there. And those wing dams help push the water to the middle of the river because the water has to go somewhere. It hits this dam, it'll hit the dam, and it'll flow towards the middle, making the water um, deeper in the middle so ships like this going through are protected. So that's what we have wing dams for in the Mississippi River. And one other thing I want to talk about today is the fact that early minute, the early people that lived in Minnesota and we're talking when these large mammals were still around. So we're talking, going back to the Ice Age and as, as with glaciers still around, killing a woolly mammoth. Um, they were huge animals. Um, so when they would hunt these, they would try to kill it with spears, trying to aim for the belly, so coming up underneath the animal. When they finally attacked it enough, it would take about two to three days for that animal to die. Then she would bleed out, and it would just die, and they, they followed the animal, and it says they tracked the animal. When that happened, one person would run back and tell the village, saying, hey, a mammoth died, we need to go. The village would move to the kill. They would take as much of that animal as they could. So they would eat the meat. They would drink the blood. I know that sounds gross, but it's a good way to get you know, nutrients inside your body. They would use the blubber, so the fatty part for whether they're cooking or you know heat to burn. And the hide was used for clothes and shelter. And the, the bones would even have been used for, like, tools, weapons, things like that. But going back to the hide, it was the job of the women to chew it, to soften it, so you could work it into whether it's clothes or shelter. So they wanted to use as much of that mammoth as they could. So those are the, some of the ancient Minnesotans that lived here. And as I just mentioned, the glaciers, and last week you watched that video on the glaciers, or it might have been two weeks ago. It's all blended together now. Um, Minnesota has parts that were never touched by glaciers. One of those areas was the southeast Minnesota, which we call the dripless area because Minnesota, that part of Minnesota has never been touched by glaciers. There are a lot of caves there because of the running water has leaked into the limestone, eroding it, creating those glaciers. Um, so those are the couple pages of notes that I want to go over today. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or anything like that. So just quick recap what today you're doing. You're doing the second box of your daily geo questions. You are reading in the ebook, um, the orange box right here that's on 210. And then you answer question number nine in your packet. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, take care and have a good rest of your day. Maybe I'll stop this. Bye.